we are at the venue for our multicultural day on Sunday the 21st of July. Set your dates, set your calendars, invite your family and your friends. It's a great evangelism tool. This is a great way to show people the other side of church. We've got inflatables, we've got bouncy castles, we've got kick um, archery. We've got a whole host of activities for you foot and golf, your family. Foot golf, foot golf, um, got lots of food. There's going to be barbecue, barbecue. <laughs> there's going to be cultural food. So if you haven't yet sent your countries in, then please do so. If you're Nigerian, if you're Ghanaian, if you're Jamaican, if you're St. Lucian, show up and represent your country. Bring your food, bring your culture. It's a multicultural day, hint, hint. Um, but we're also going to be re-recording our I Love My Church video. So it's going to be phenomenal. So bring your friends, invite your family. It's going to be a great evangelism tool as well as a great fun day. So see you there on Sunday, the 21st of July, after service. Would you like to get involved in serving in church? There are many departments that you could join and serve in. But to do this, you first need to complete your membership and foundation classes. These classes last for six weeks. This gives us a chance to see what you believe and also gives you a chance to know what we believe as a church. If you'd like to do these classes, then please see Beatrice at the payment table to put your name down. The Eagle's Nest Cafe is recruiting. If you are a good team player, a fun, and you're hardworking, you do well under pressure, then you could be exactly what we are looking for. We are happy to train you so you'll be fully barista trained and you'll learn how to prepare and serve food. If you'd like to be part of our ever-growing team, then please see me, Danny, after the service, or you can email the church at v2vchurch at aol.co.uk. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that you will have a blessed week and do not forget to do the work of the evangelist. Welcome to Wednesday midweek service. I hope that you're well. I pray that you've had an incredible week so far. Um, just before I start, before we go into the word today, be your brother's keeper today. Um, before I start the message, just pick up your phone for a second and message the people within your contacts and invite them to church online this evening. We never stop evangelizing. We never miss an opportunity to evangelize. So I encourage you to just stop, stop for a second before you allow the word to bless you and refresh you. Just find someone, five people, six people on your contacts and send them the link for this service today. Amen. Amen. Are we ready? Are we ready for the word today? Let's go before God in prayer. Let's dedicate this time to God today. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the power of your word, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, that we're able to open your word once again, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, for the revelation in your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. We invite you to speak to our hearts, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we invite you to replace anything that doesn't look like you or feel like you or sound like you, Father God. We invite you into those places, Father God, and we breathe, ask you to breathe the breath of your life into our spirits, into our souls, into our minds right now, Father God. And for those believing for healing, Father God, we believe for supernatural healing to be breathed into their bodies this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So I've got a great message for you this evening. And I just invite you to grab your Bibles. I know that you're at home and it's easy to kind of multitask and do all of those things. But I would ask just for the next 45 minutes, if you could just still yourself and just take in um, the word for tonight, this evening. Amen. Just position yourself to receive. Amen. So for those of you taking notes, and I hope everybody is taking notes, my title for today is The Enemies of Our Faith. Say that out loud wherever you are. The Enemies of Our Faith. 
Um, let's turn, if we can, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 12. And it says from verse 12, let me just get there. Should have brought my glasses. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good c confession in the presence of many witnesses. And we're going to just really grab hold of the first part of that, of that verse and of that scripture today. It says that we are to fight the good fight of faith. How many of you growing up when you were in school or, um, you know, maybe as a teenager got into a fight? How many of you got into a fight by yourself? Most of the time, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, when you're in a fight, the whole purpose of a fight is that there is an opponent. There's somebody else that you're fighting. I remember in my days when there used to be a fight, you'd know, you knew there was a fight because you'd hear fight, 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 fight. And usually there was a ring of people around two individuals and they were throwing punches and doing all of that stuff and then usually there'd be a teacher that would emerge from somewhere and break it up that's the kind of school that I went to but we know that if there's a fight then there has to be enemies right and in this scripture he's saying that we're to fight the good fight of faith so if there is if we're in a fight it lets us know that we're in a fight and there's also enemies we need to fight the good fight of faith so we need to fight for our faith is what he's saying so the enemies of our faith aren't what most people people think they are many people look for enemies in the natural realm but that's not where they are they're not your husband they're not your wife they're not your children they're not your boss those are not your enemies that we're fighting what we're talking about here today I know sometimes we can convince ourselves that those are our enemies but those are not our enemies um, uh, Paul gives seven qualities of Christian character in 2 Peter chapter 1 uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 7 turn across with me if you can 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 7 and he says but also for this very reason given all diligence add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge to knowledge self-control to self-control perseverance to perseverance uh, godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love so it we see here where the foundation that's given here is faith and everything else is built upon this in fact all of these character traits towards the God type of love manifesting the God type of love is given first as the as faith as the foundation level. So we know that um, a whole book in Hebrews um, chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, the whole chapter is devoted to faith. Um, and he says, in fact, in Hebrews 11 verse 6, that without faith is impossible to please God. So we know that faith is a crucial element of one's Christian walk and one's Christian faith. Without faith, we don't get to see God, we don't get to experience God, um, and we don't get to we don't get to please God. So we know that faith is crucial in our relationship with God. It's crucial in our development and our spiritual growth. Without faith, we cannot please God. We're not the only ones that are aware of this. The enemy is very aware of this fact as well. Turn with me if you can to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 we're just laying a foundation here until we really break this apart Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 and he says for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places like all enemies they have weapons that they use to defeat their opponents their enemies the greatest weapon that a Christian will ever have at their disposal is their faith you take out a Christian's faith and you take that Christian out the enemy is very aware of this the enemy knows that living um, faith is essential to a growing relationship with our Lord and Savior so he uses dangerous enemies that attack our faith such as worry such as fear such as doubt such as human reasoning such as false or religious thinking and a lack of knowledge to come against our faith we know if most of us if a demon appeared in our room we would run we would uh, we would know this is an enemy we would hopefully most of us would stand and fight that demon and we would cast it out and 
cast it into dry places in the name of Jesus. But some of us that might not know our authority yet would run in the opposite direction. Either way, none of us would be under any disillusion that this is an enemy, that this is not something that's good. This is not something that we should allow into our lives, into our minds, into our hearts. If, it, if everything appeared like a, a, a demon, then we would know 100% this is what it is. But now what he does is he disguises these enemies of our faith into these different categories, whether that is um, a lack of knowledge, whether that is human reasoning, whether that is fear, doubt or worry. They present themselves in a way that we can accept them, that we don't even see them coming. We all know the story with the Trojan horse. Had they all rocked up at the gate, dressed in their armor and ready for battle, how many of you know they never would have opened the gate? But they put them inside a horse. They presented it in a way that was appealing to be accepted. And then the minute that it came in, then he was able to destroy um, the armies from within. Similarly, that's what the devil does. He will disguise it as, oh, I'm just feeling a little bit worried. Oh, it's just a bit of fear. Oh, it's just a bit of whatever. And we disguise it as something else other than what it is. And then we, before we know it, our faith has been depleted. So let's look at some of these enemies that we have to deal with and look at them from God's standpoint. Um, each one of us has the potential to harbor these ne negative characteristics um, and as a result our faith can be severely stunted or perhaps nullified altogether. So let's look at the first enemy of our faith. The first one is a lack of knowledge. Say that out loud with me, a lack of knowledge. Turn with me if you can to Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Let's read that together. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. And he says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The greatest hindrance to our faith is a lack of knowledge of God's word. Because faith comes by hearing the word. All enemies of our faith are connected in some way with our lack of knowledge. It, it's, it depending on what we hear or what we choose to hear. When we don't take the time to know this word for ourselves. When we rely on podcasts or Instagram posts or TikTok posts or whatever else, we are waved to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Uh, the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Um, when we don't have the word grounding us and keeping us, we don't know what the word of God says. We haven't taken the time to know God for ourselves. Daniel 11, 32 says, those that do know their God shall be strong and do ex great exploits. How do you become strong? How do you do great exploits? You have have to know the word you have to have the word of God on the inside of you you have to know how to rightly divide the word of God one thing that I always teach my Bible school students is everything in the Bible is true not everything is a statement of truth so you can easily misquote scripture because of your lack of knowledge or understanding um, you you can take scripture out of context um, you can make scripture fit what it is that you want to do because you can take it out of context just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's a statement statement of truth. What do I mean by that? That um, there's certain things that God says as statements of truth. It's the way that we need to live. It's a it's a um, a commandment. It's it's not it's non-negotiable. It's non-optional. For example, you will not commit adultery. That's repeated multiple times throughout the Bible. If you're ever curious as to whether something is a statement of truth, God will continually repeat Himself. He will at least do it three times, if not more. Um, he continually speaks about tithing. He continually speaks about loving your neighbor. He continually talks about um, not being angry. He continually talks about um, salvation and preparing yourself for the coming of Christ. There's certain things that he constantly revisits. Those are statements of faith. Those are the things that we need to hold on to and we need to apply to our day-to-day -day life. You've got to remember that the Bible was written to instruct different churches and different leaders. Some things in there would have been as, as in result of a question that's been raised or asked as a result of that but everything in the bible is true but not everything is a statement of truth if you don't study your bible you won't know what's a statement of truth you will you'll become confused you'll become double-minded you won't know what the word of god says amen hosea chapter 4 verse 6 
Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 it says my people perish or are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge when you know God faith comes as soon as the light of the word comes faith is there it accompanies knowledge knowledge of what God has said comes first then faith automatically accompanies it we need to recognize and realize that faith, um, the word is what builds faith on the inside of us. When we, when um, the devil, when Jesus was tempted, when he was fasting for the 40 days, what did he do? He used the word against the um, enemy. He knew the word. That's what he used to combat the enemy when he tried to bring fear or doubt. It was knowledge that was the principal thing. If he didn't know the word of God for himself, he didn't. if he didn't have the word of God embedded on the inside of him, he would have began to question it because the devil was misquoting scripture back to him he was twisting scripture to try and fit what he's his agenda what he was trying to do but because the, the Jesus knew the word he had the knowledge of the word he had the correct knowledge of the word the Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved a workman that need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth we have to study the Bible guys we can't be lazy we can't piggyback off of um, someone else's um, uh, revelation or someone else's faith. We have to study the word of God. You have to get into the word. You have to read it. You have to know what it is that you're believing. You have to um, put things into context. You can't misquote scripture and make it fit your doctrine. You can't create your own doctrines. The word of God is the word of God. It's forever established. It does not change. We need to make sure that we know what the word of God is. So when the enemy comes against us and says contrary to the word of God, we we, we speak the word of God back to him. We declare the scriptures back to him. I thank you, Lord God, with long life have you satisfied me. I thank you, Lord God, that you cause my health to spring forth speedily. I thank you, Lord God, that as for me and my house, we will serve the living God. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given me a sound mind in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, that great is my peace. I thank you, Lord God, that you said that you'll give your beloved sweet sleep. So when I lie down to sleep tonight, my sleep is sweet. I thank you, Lord God, that your word says that I will be like um, a tree planted by the rivers of water that will um, forever bear its fruit. I thank you, Lord God, that you'll water me in, in my due season. I thank you, Lord God, that I walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, but in all my ways I acknowledge you and, I, and you shall direct my path. I thank you, Lord God, that your word says that you will rebuke the devourer for my sake. I thank you, Lord God, that the word says that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. I thank you, Lord God, that your word says that if I, if, um, that if I bring my tithe into the storehouse, that you will rebuke the devourer. I thank you, Lord God, that you said that you will open up the windows of heaven and you will pour out a blessing on my life that I will not have room enough to receive it. I thank you, Lord God, that your word says... We need to know the word. We need to be able to quote the word. We need to be able to speak the word. When something comes against us, when there is an attack on our minds, on our spirits, on our soul, it's the knowledge of God that's going to be able to counteract. When we, when our faith is taken out, it's because we have a lack of knowledge as to what our belief system is. We don't know what we believe. We don't know why we believe it. We, you know, we hear something on TikTok and all of a sudden our doctrine is shaken. It's moved. It's it's tossed to and fro because we don't know what we believed we never knew what we believed because we were lazy we don't want to study we don't want to um read the word we don't want to go to bible school we don't want to do any of those things we, we we're lazy with it even the bible school students i challenge them on sunday assignments i give them they come back they haven't done it come on guys we need to get desperate with this thing we need to get to a point where we're thirsty we're hungry for this word we need this word we devour this word it's like life to us we devour it we you know how many of us really can say that we've read this bible from front to back how many of us and there's so many people for looking for things that are not in here my, my answer to everybody that's looking for how many angels there are in heaven and how this is that and how that is that. When was the last time you done what you actually read? We've got people caught up in nonsense. They, they, they're turning away from Christianity or church for things that are irrelevant. What about the things that are relevant? Do not fornicate. Have you stopped doing that? Honor the Lord God with your first fruits of your increase. Have you done that? Love your neighbor, bless your enemy, pray for your enemy. Have you done that? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. 
make disciples. Have you done that? See, we like to jump out of this and, and label it as Christianity, label it as religiosity. But the reality is we're jumping out because we're distracted. <coughs> we're jumping out because we're constantly looking. The Bible says it. We heap onto ourselves teachers but never come into the knowledge of the truth because there is a generation that don't really want this knowledge. They don't really want to learn. They want to hear. They, they heap to themselves all of these things, but they never want to do anything with what they hear. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But it's not enough to just hear. We've got to do. We've got to put into action what it is that we hear. Amen. The second enemy of our faith is worry. The second enemy of our faith is worry. Let's turn, if we can, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, and it says, Now if God um, so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus tells us that we that those who worry have little faith. Why would he say that? Why would worry be an enemy of faith? He explains it when he says, why should you question what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you'll wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Why do the Gentiles seek these things? Because they don't know who God is. Of course, they're going to be worried. If they're reliant on themselves and they're reliant on just their own ability, of course, you will be worried. But when you understand the sovereignty of God, when you understand the majesty of God, when you understand him as Alpha and Omega, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, when you understand him on, on all of these areas, why on earth would you be worried? God is not unaware of our needs. And if he has committed himself to providing them for us, why should we worry about them? If we trust in God to provide our needs, then we must let him do it in his time and in his way. There is no need to become trapped in a lifestyle of worry. I wrote this down and I said, worry is directed inward. Faith is directed upward. I'll say that one more time. Worry is directed inward. Faith is directed upward. When we are in faith, Christ, when we know who Christ is, when we understand who Christ is, faith directs us upwards. The psalm says it like this, I look unto the hills from whence comes my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Worry looks inward. Worry looks at what I can do, how I can fix this. What am I going to do? That's why you stay up all night. That's why you worry. That's why you don't sleep because you're looking at yourself. You're not looking at God. You're not looking upwards at the person that can help you. You're looking at your paycheck. You're looking at your job circumstance. You're looking at your job situation. That's why when they make everyone redundant you fall to pieces that's why when that medical report comes that is negative you fall to pieces that's why when your children are wiling out or acting out you fall to pieces that's why you're when your marriage is feels like it's hit a brick wall and it's at the end of its um, term you fall to pieces but there, there's a there's a group of people that understand the faith forces myself to look upwards so yes everything in all of hell feels like it may be loose against me but when I know the people that do know their God when I know my God it forces my head up yes all everything that could go wrong has gone wrong however I look to the author and the finisher of my faith knowing that he is able to keep me he is able to sustain me he is able to position me he is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and when I understand that I will not worry I will not worry Luke chapter 10 verse 41 says Mary and Martha Martha it says that you are worried about many things Martha was so busy she was so busy that she didn't get to sit at the feet of Jesus she was busy the Bible says she was busy doing many things she was busy doing much 
And he said, your sister Martha has done the right, um, the, your sister Mary has done the right thing. She's, she's sat. And sometimes in life, we can get so busy with life that we don't get the time. We don't make the time, I should say, to put the word of God in. We don't make the time to fill our homes with worship and with praise. We don't take the time to fill our atmosphere with God. And then we wonder why we're now struggling with worry because our, our, our tank is empty. Our well is dry. And today I would say to you, if you're struggling with worry, if you're struggling with um, a lack of knowledge, you need to fill your well back up. You need to take that time aside. You need to begin to pray. You need to begin to worship. You need to begin to cry out to God. You've tried it in your own strength. You've tried it in your own ability. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So go to the one that is able to do something about it. Your best friend is not able to fix it. Your parents are not able to fix it. Your husband, your wife are not able to fix it. The one that can is the source of all sources. And his name is Jesus Christ. Begin to cry out to him. Begin to put him in your day. Instead of worry, replace it with faith in the name of Jesus. Martha got so caught up in the doing that she failed to sit at the master's feet. She was doing things in her own strength and in her own ability. And then she wondered why she got burnt out. The third enemy of our faith is fear. We must know our enemies in order to defend ourselves against them. The, the Bible warns about fear that it can cripple our faith and stunt our Christian growth. Let's turn, if we can, just across the page from where we just were at Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 26. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 26. Turn there with me if you can. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 26. And it says, Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked, rebuked the winds and the sea, and they were of great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? So looking at this storm, it looked in the natural like they were doomed. They had every reason in the natural to fear. But dem Jesus demonstrated to them that faith is the thing that they needed, not fear. It was Jesus, it was God that created the winds and the waves and he had the complete power over them that never changed. Faith is what will calm every single fear in our life. There will be times where the storms will come. There will be times where it feels like everything that has gone wrong the will can go wrong has gone wrong there will be times where it feels like the waves are tossing and turning the winds are howling and it will feel like sometimes that jesus is asleep in the bottom of your boat but i encourage you today do not allow fear to come in do not allow fear to come in today Faith, uh, fear is a faith killer it will kill faith every time it's the enemy of faith don't allow fear to come in. When you feel fear knocking at your door, hit it back with the word of God. Use your, your sword of your, the spirit, which is the word of God. Use it to combat fear. That's how you defeat fear as your enemy. You speak the word of God. You declare the word of God. You speak the word of God over that fearful situation. When all fear is coming against you, when it looks like your back's against the wall, when it looks like all, 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 all cards are on the table, you've lost the game. You know what? It just takes one word from God. It just takes one movement from from God it just takes one breath from God and just like that that situation can turn around that situation can move I love what pastor shared on Sunday um, with the children of Israel when the lepers came out and they were they were starving and they said you know what if we if we if we get killed then we get killed but if we stay here we die and they went out into the enemy's camp and they'd heard a sound from heaven they'd heard a sound from heaven and that one sound 
sound is what defeated the enemy. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what is presented to you today. And I know that fear is, is gripping so many people's hearts today with this economy, with what's going on. You know, will they raise this? Will these taxes be in place? Will my job be secure? Um, you know, you might be fighting for a loved one today. You might be fighting for your health. But I'm here to tell you today that God is the same yesterday. He's the same today and he's the same forever. He does not change. He, if he said it, then he will do it. Don't allow fear to come into your heart and make you think otherwise in Jesus' name. Hebrews 13 verse 6 says, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We have nothing to fear as long as we have Almighty God on our side. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If your mind is being attacked, if worry, anxiety, fear and doubt are bombarding your mind, you need to say this scripture and declare it every single day. I thank you, Lord God, that you've not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love love and of a sound mind in the name of Jesus. Let's remember that these enemies of faith strive to keep them and let's try to strive to keep them out of our lives. We need to recognize them as enemies. They're not a part of who you are. It's not a part of your normal day-to-day -day life. It's not normal to worry. It's not normal to fear. It's not normal to doubt as a Christian. It's not normal to do any of those things. When we are when we are operating any of those things, when we're manifesting these characteristics, it means that we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. Amen. The fourth enemy of our faith is doubt. Doubt sank Peter and it can punch holes in our faith as well. But the scripture makes it clear that um, no doubt um, God will fulfill his promises with if we would just believe. Let's turn if we can to Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 23. Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 23. Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 23. Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 23 and it says immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away and when he sent the multitudes away he went up on the mountain by himself to pray now when evening came he was alone there but the boat was now in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves for the wind was contrary now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you little of faith, why did you doubt? I would say the same thing to you that Jesus said to Peter that day. Why do you doubt? If you know that Jesus is who he says that he is, he will hold your hand no matter what the circumstance that surrounds you. No matter how boisterous the seas become, no matter how hard the affliction feels like it's been, he will hold you if you will keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. Peter in this portion of scripture allowed um, doubt to enter his heart and it was doubt that caused him to sink there are so many Christians today that allow doubt to come into their heart doubt that the person leading me is the person that's supposed to be leading me doubt that the word of God is what it says that it is doubt that Jesus is who he says he is doubt that he will keep me doubt that he will fulfill my needs doubt and we we, we put all this doubt and doubt is the opposite of faith Doubt is an enemy of faith. A storm arose tossing the boat about. During the storm, Jesus approached up top the fierce waves. The disciples were astounded. They knew that it was Jesus. He identified himself and he said, come. We can imagine that Peter would have been nervous, but he bravely stepped out of the boat and walked towards Christ. 
But the minute that he took his eyes off of Jesus and started focusing on the circumstance, doubt sunk him. According to the dictionary, doubt means to, to be uncertain about, to consider questionable or unlikely, to hesitate to believe or to distrust. I'll say that one more time. To be uncertain about, to consider questionable or unlikely, to hesitate to believe or to distrust. Are you uncertain about God today? Do you question his abilities today? Do you think that he's unlikely to fulfill his word today? Do you hesitate to believe what he says today? Do you distrust God today? Well, I will know that by your lifestyle. I will know that whether you stop tithing or giving. I will know that by the way that you respond when situations or afflictions or circumstances come your way. I will know whether you are uncertain about God. I will know whether you find God questionable. I will know whether you find God unlikely to fulfill his word or his promises. I'll, I'll know whether you hesitate to believe or, or whether you distrust him by the way that you respond. Pastor always says that you will never know what's in a tea bag until you put hot water on it. The flavor will never be released until the hot water is put on the tea bag. It's designed to take heat and that's what brings it out. I wonder if we were, if our faith was a flavor today, how many of us would taste like God? Where how many of us would be easily identified as a faith, as, a, as someone that walks in faith? Because what's in us will come out when the trials come, when things get tight, when money is tight, when our health is not where it's supposed to be, when our marriage is not what it's supposed to be, when our children are not what they're supposed to be, when we're finding ourselves wearied or tired or, or doubting or we don't have what we want, that husband hasn't come when in the time frame that we allocated, that, that wife hasn't come in the time frame that we gave God to, to bring it, that child hasn't come in the way that we wanted it to come. What will happen to your faith then? The Bible says, though it tarries, wait for it. It doesn't say though it tarries doubt and fear and get into anxiety. It says though it tarries, wait for it because he is faithful. So how can we have faith in something we are uncertain about or what we question is unlikely? If we hesitate to believe something or we don't have trust in it, we certainly don't have faith in it, do we? Doubt is chaotic to true faith. The fifth enemy of our faith is human reasoning. I put here that faith sees beyond the physical senses and reasons beyond the human sphere. The limited realm of human reasoning can be damaging to our faith. The fifth enemy of our faith needs, that we need to be aware of is human reasoning. So what is human reasoning? It's looking at things from the human perspective, consciously or unconsciously, leaving God out of the picture. It's trying to figure out spiritual things on our own. Is looking at the trials of this life and tr with just our physical senses without seeing the unseen hand of God in the picture. Human reasoning can be assuming that God sees things as we see them. It's putting God in our box, in our, in our rule system. For example, having a child. We, we think that our body has a body clock and once we go past a certain age then we can never have children anymore. Well, God's the one that made our bodies, right? And we see an example of this in Genesis chapter one, 18, verses 1 to 15. Turn there with me if you can. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. I had some glasses. I left them actually in the car. Um, but I'm going to show you, give you an illustration. I don't know if Dominic, have you got any glasses? Any, yeah, any, yeah, glasses for your eyes. Do you have any? Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. It says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. While he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, so that you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. 
Now that you've come to your servant very well, they answered, do as, they, as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three shears of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice, tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these foods before the, uh, these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked. There in the tent, he said. There, then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, will, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah was a very, already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed herself, and she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But she said, yes, you did laugh. So I was going to use some glasses to show you that. Yeah, let me have those. Thank you. So Dominic's very trendy glasses, much more trendy than the ones I was going to use. So I God was showing th this to me when I was... Um, studying this when we look with our natural eyes for some of us our vision is blurred we need glasses to be able to see clearly right and we go to the eye optician and we they check our eyes and if our vision is not completely focused and they they show you the the chart you know and you've got to say the a b c d and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and in our human ability sometimes we're not able to see in the natural what is in front of us and so they give us glasses to wear and those glasses are to help us to see better to see what's already there but we in our natural state with our natural ability are unable to see and those glasses will be adjusted dep depending on how much or how great the need is well similarly in the spirit realm we need to put on the glasses of faith do you like my glasses we need to put on the glasses of faith. So when we when we have a situation that looks like it's beyond our ability, when it looks like, God, there is no way that this can happen in my own strength, in my own ability. Instead of with Sarah looking at her own ability, she looks at her age. She looks at the condition of her womb. She looks at her husband. She looks at everything else other than what God saw. See, through the eyes of faith, we are able to see things it's like all of a sudden everything becomes enlightened. We can see clearly our focus is there. We're able to see clearly what God is saying, what God is doing. You know what, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I can see clearly that you are the God of the impossible, that you are Alpha, you are Omega, you are beginning the end. All of a sudden, our, our, our faith eyes are enlightened. We suddenly have faith to move mountains. We have faith to shift atmospheres. We have faith to speak into situations that seems impossible why not not because anything necessarily in the room has changed but we put on our glasses of faith we put on our eyes of faith we've asked God to cause us to see and if you're struggling today to see in the natural as to what God is doing stop looking at your bank account stop looking at your own health stop looking at your own ability but I don't know how to speak publicly I don't know how to do this I don't know if I can do this I don't know if I'm able to do that how will God do this how how will he provide for me? I'm in debt. I, I'm sick. I, I, my marriage is at, uh, at the breaking point. My children don't um, even come home most nights. They don't even serve God. You're looking at the natural. Like Sarah, you're looking at the natural and in that you're allowing doubt and fear and unbelief to come in. It's an enemy of your faith. God is not the God of the natural world. He is the God that has a castle on a thousand hills. He is the God of the universe that when he speaks, oceans have to obey. When he speaks, mountains have to move. When he speaks, animals have to obey what he says. He is the God of the universe. And I encourage you today, just like in the natural, I'm putting on these glasses in the spirit realm. Pick up your spiritual glasses today. Some of us have put those down. And we're just now walking around 
blindly going by our own ability and our own strength trying to figure it out okay you know what i'll get a, i'll get a better job i'll get five jobs i'll get 10 jobs i'll get 30 jobs i'll do this i'll do that we're, we're doing it in our own strength and our own ability where does get god get the glory in any of that but when we put on the our spiritual glasses all of a sudden we see the word of god as it's meant to be oh your word says that you shall supply all my needs according to your riches in glory of course it does oh father god your word says that by my stripes you i am healed by your stripes i am healed of course i am all of a sudden we start looking through the eyes of faith when was the last time you put on your faith glasses when was the last time the pharisees and sadducees and scribes of jesus time were noted for using the human reasoning instead of exploring the evidence and believing what god was showing them a classic example of this is found in mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 turn there with me if you can mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 and it says and again he entered capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house immediately many gathered together so there was no longer room to receive them not even near the door and he preached the word to them then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men and when they could not come near him because of the crowd they uncovered the roof where he was so when they had broken through they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying when jesus saw their faith he said to the paralytic son your sins are forgiven you and some of the scribes that were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts um why does this man speak blasphemies like this who can forgive sins but god alone see they had a they had a perception of how things should be done in the natural when god wants to do it he will do it exactly the way that he wants to do it he will use whoever he wants to my goodness if he can use a female donkey he can use a child he can use a woman he can use a man he will use whatever vessel is required to bring about his his miracle to you and to bring his word to his people but so many times we get caught up in our own human reasonings our human traditions our human ways of doing things and it's an enemy of our faith it's an enemy of our faith human reasoning dismisses the spiritual things we cannot grasp with our physical minds and senses it it removes the the element of the miraculous it removes the element of the spiritual it removes the element of god doing what only he can do human um human reasoning is an enemy of our faith in order to drive out these five enemies of our faith we need to stay close to god when we find ourselves entertaining worry doubt fear human reasoning or we find ourselves operating with a lack of, lack of knowledge we need to immediately talk to god about it we need to begin to reassess and realize that we've allowed something in john chapter 10 verse 27 says that my sheep know my voice and i know them and they follow me my question to each of us today is what voice are we listening to today we should god ask god to help us to grow in our faith in our regular daily prayers and our devotions every single hour we can approach god at any time we can talk to god while we're driving while we're eating while we're cleaning our house while we're working we can talk to god each and every single day the most important thing is that we talk to him often and we speak to him regularly the enemies of our faith come in when we stop talking to god let's take time to learn about living our faith as we open the scriptures and look into god's word in our daily walk with the lord the alpha and the omega of our faith the bible tells us which i read at the beginning in first timothy 6 12 that we're to fight the good fight of faith i'd say to you get back into the fight today jesus gave his disciples many examples of the power of faith psalms 119 verse 130 says the entrance of thy words gives light if you have doubt coming in allow the light of god to illuminate you today 
Ephesians 2.10 says, we did not make ourselves anew. He did. He says, we are the workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He's the one that made us. He's the one that will keep us. He will not give us more than we can bear. Uh, Mark 11.24 says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, if you believe that you receive them, you shall have them. Believe, not hope that you receive. Hope is a human reaction. You may call it believing, but that doesn't make it so. You need to have faith in God today. Ephesians 1.3 says that, um, that he will bless us with every spiritual blessing. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We've got to understand that faith is present tense. The blessings have already been provided for us by Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things still not seen. We have to learn to trust in God's word and we have to let go of all the enemies of our faith that come against it. We have to examine the evidence and grow in faith. Faith is the evidence of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to focus on the sure promises of God. He says that in 1 Peter 5, 4, that the sh chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. We need to understand that we have a God that does not fail. He does not relent on his word. Faith is our evidence. It's, it's being absolutely convinced that God's promises given to us through his prophets and apostles are rock solid and they apply to each and every member of our life, every single part of our lives. Whenever doubt creeps into our minds, we should go to God for help to strengthen our faith. We should refresh our minds with spiritual evidence of God's sure promises. Um, there's a song that I was singing last night and it says, uh, it says, Hallelujah. You're an answering God. Hallelujah. You're an answering God. I prayed in Jesus' name. And then the answer came. Hallelujah. You're an answering God. Let that song ring in your heart this evening. I don't know what fear or what doubt or what worry or what human reasoning or what lack of knowledge has been bombarding your mind recently. But I would say to you, have faith in God. Let your faith not crumble. The Apostle Paul says it like this, having done all to stand, I will stand. Listen, you will go through trials, you'll go through temptations. There will be things that happen that you may not understand, but God doesn't change in any of this. So I encourage you today to put your faith in God. Don't stop doing the principles that activate faith in your life. Giving is a principle. Give to God through what seems impossible. Don't stop doing the word. Don't stop doing the commandments. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, do the word, read the word, be the word in Jesus name. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask each person today, if you don't know Jesus Christ and you're your personal Lord and Savior, it would be my greatest honor to lead you to Christ today through the salvation prayer. You know if you live for God, you know that if he's the Lord of your life, I'm not talking about a religion, I'm not talking about a, a, a brief understanding of him, I'm not talking about a brief knowledge of him, I'm talking about a complete and utter acceptance of Jesus Christ into your heart, given him permission to change and transform your life in the way that only he can. I wanna give you that opportunity today. If you say to me, Sarah, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I would like to then I want you to say this prayer with me and repeat it after me and mean it with all your heart. Say, Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart, to be my Lord and to be my saviour from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. 
If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we'd love to get a Bible to you. We'd love to answer any questions that you have. Please email us at v2vchurch at aol.co.uk. That's V, the number two, V again, church at aol.co.uk. Please email us. We'd love to get a Bible to you. We'd love to welcome you to the family of God. Amen. Amen. Before we go today, um, let's turn our Bibles to Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. We're going to receive our tithe and offering today. Amen. Malachi chapter 3, verse, verses, um, for verses um, verse 10. This is one of the biggest areas where we see faith stop working. When people are going through things, the first thing they want to do is they want to stop activating the spiritual principles that would actually get them through the situation. You know what, if I'm in debt, the first thing that I want to do is I want to stop tithing because then I can't afford to, to pay what I've got, but I'm going to withhold the one thing that's going to give me the ability to receive a harvest. No seed, no harvest. That's how it works. And in um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it, at first, let's start from verse 8. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me, but you say, In what way have we robbed you? And he says, In tithes and in offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. And he gives us an instruction. He says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And then he gives us the why. He says, That there may be food in my house, and try me now, and this is the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, there'll not be room enough to receive it. And he gives us a promise. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for, for, for you in the fields, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. I don't know about you, but this is something that I stand on. When it feels like I'm doing everything within my own strength and in my own power and it's still not working, I go to the word of God and I'm able to activate this principle in my life because I do what it says. I'm a tither. I give to God on a regular basis. I give in the first fruits of my day. And as a result, I know that he will come through with me with these promises. Don't stop activating the, the principle that will bring the blessing to you today. Amen. If you would like to, um, if you want to, um, if you want to give your um, tithe and offering, if you um, want to do that today, you could go um, to our website, www.b2bcommunitychurch.com. Uh, there's a donate button there. You could do that there. You could also give via PayPal, b2bchurch at aol.co.uk. Um, as you get ready to do that, I just want to pray with you. I just want to pray over you, whatever it is that you're believing God for today. I believe that as you sow this seed in in your tithe and your offering the offering is the the surplus of what you're obligated to do your tithe is what you should be doing your offering is what you sow as an additional seed amen as you do that, I want to pray with you today. Father God, I thank you, Lord God, for every person online, Father God. I thank you, Lord God, that as we activate this principle, Father God, of seed time and harvest, Father God, that you stand true to your word, Father God, that you honor your word. Father God, every person believing you for financial breakthrough, Father God, I touch and I agree with them right now, Father God, wherever they're at, the Lord God, the uh, windows will open over heaven. I believe for the miraculous. I believe for the supernatural. Those believing for heaven, health and healing father god whether it be it be emotionally whether it be physically father god whether it be through their marriages or their families father god i stand and i agree with them right now father god in the name of jesus i pray for your healing power to flow father god those believing for jobs and job opportunities father god i stand and i agree with them i thank you lord god that your word says that you shall supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory in jesus name we pray in jesus name have an amazing evening, everybody. Don't forget, we've got church at 10 a.m. Um, every Sunday. We've got prayer Monday to Friday, um, 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. So please make sure that you join us for those. Amen. God bless you. Amen.